so many different people um, touch this transaction. And yes, you are correct. You have to make sure they're doing their job. However, you also have to make sure that those people are human. <laughs> and those people have lives too. Those people make mistakes also. And I think a lot of times that is what's overlooked. Like these people, just like you said, you don't want the stress on you when you are at the end of the day, these are people and we have to realize the world does not revolve around us and we have to offer grace when grace is needed. There, there are slackers, don't get me wrong, and they have to be micromanaged or reminded or whatever, but people have lives. And I think that um, oftentimes we forget that because we want what we want so much. You are listening to the Real Estate Proverbs podcast with host Kevin Jefferson. This is the number one podcast for African-American real estate professionals who are doing extraordinary things. It's time to tune in. And now your host, the people's lender, Kevin Jefferson. Kevin Jefferson. Welcome to the Real Estate Proverbs podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Jefferson. And today our guest is Ms. Zelma Singleton. How are you? I'm well, Kevin. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, mm-hmm. Looking forward to this, to talk to a fellow loan officer, get your perspective on the market uh, in general and the market in your area. Um, yes, for the purposes of this, I'll call you Zalma, but you know your nickname. <laughs> 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 Tell us a little bit about who you are. Um, so I'm Zelma. I am a native Houstonian. I have a lot of family in Louisiana. Former teacher, been doing um, loan origination for about two years now. Started off part time and then um, ended up going full time around the pandemic. Gotcha. So, with that being said, it's interesting. Um, what, what grade did you teach? I was a middle school teacher. So, I've taught six seventh and eighth well actually I've actually taught fifth grade for a little while too but majority of my career was sixth seventh and eighth grade okay um what what got you into even doing loans part-time so um as a teacher my kind of side hustle was a landlord and so I just kind of really started wanting to know the ins and outs of financing real estate. And so I thought the best way to be able to finance real estate was to actually, you know, become a loan officer and know the tricks of the trade and um, learn it from beginning to end. OK. And how long were you a teacher? Ten years. 10 years. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. What subject? I taught math and then I taught history um, at the tail end uh, for about two years. Okay. Yeah. So what was your expectation of what a loan officer did in financing and what it, what it's really like? Let's see. So I guess I thought that the loan officer had more control, Um, you know, at the very beginning, meaning like um, I didn't really understand Fannie and Freddie guidelines, you know, because you have so many different banks and mortgage companies offering you know, loans of different sorts is just, I always would hear if one loan officer turns you down, find another one. You know, that's kind of like the word on the street. But in actuality, it's kind of true, but kind of not true. Because when you say find another one, it's just more so of finding one that may know something that the other one may not know or realize something that the other one may not have realized. So there, we're all following the same guidelines. It's just the level of knowledge you know those guidelines at. So 
I think for me, that was the most surprising thing. Like, oh, it's not really um, per se, um, you know, Chase is asking something different than NRL mortgage is just more so the person. And so I always compare loan officers to attorneys. And I say, we're like the attorney and then the underwriter is like the judge. So you have good attorneys, you have bad attorneys. You have some that, you know, lose no cases and you have some that lose every case. So I kind of look at being a loan officer in the same way. Gotcha. I've never um, heard that analogy, but it makes sense. Right. Um, So from my perspective, Mm -hmm. from a former realtor, I try to establish a knowledge base of the loan process and the loan, you know, what's needed. So I can kind of help my, I could help my loan officer out when we're getting documents, right? Or I can navigate through how to make the deal work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I spent time in the loan officer's um, office and he would always say, KJ, man, this is stressful. And I was like, in my mind, I'm like, how he would always have bottles of Pepto Bismol in his drawer, <laughs> and I was like, man, no. like what? What he said just gets stressful, and you know, I'm like, okay, maybe it's just the way he takes it. Fast forward to me becoming a loan officer, I can see like where the stress comes from. Um, don't get me wrong. Realtors do a lot like our team teammates do a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. However, I think that Mm -hmm. what we do as loan officers is more intense because we have to. There's days set right with them. They don't have 30 days to find a house. Right. They don't have they've got 30 days to close the deal. But at that point, it's us as loan officers, professionals and attorneys and them like doing everything we need. So that clock starts. So our real work starts when the clock starts. Right. Right. The clock starts and we've got to go from A to Z, meaning the level of responsiveness from the buyer is going to dictate how well the file moves. And what they don't understand is at the end of the day, if something's missing, no one's going to blame the buyer. No one's going to say anything to the agent. They're going to put it all on the lender. And that's not fair, right? It's not fair. And at the same time, the buyer has to have some buy into it. So what I've done is I have changed the way I've done business, even from last year to this year. And I've lost some relationships from it, right? Because I don't want to be with my family getting calls about why this and that isn't happening. That's not what I want. I don't want the stress level to have me uh, mentally away from my family or affect me, right? because I take it to heart. I truly enjoy helping people and I take it to heart when something goes wrong and I take responsibility, whether it's my team or whoever, the buyer, it's my responsibility. It's my job to tell them what they need to get me. It's, and if it's my team, it's my job to convey the information of how this deal has to be structured. So I like, for instance, I'll give you a prime example right now. I've got a lady who every time she talks to me, can I get my pre-approval letter? Have you sent your bank statement? She sends it a screenshot. Mind you, I tell her no screenshots and I need all pages. And right after she says she sent it, she says, can I get my letter today? So I finally did a three-way call with her and a realtor because I don't put them on some of those emails with, you know, specific information because, you know, it's their privacy. Right. Right. Um, So we did a three way call and I explained to her why he knew like he knew why I was waiting because I don't want to send them out 
looking at properties and they're under contract and she doesn't have the money to close. It comes mm -hmm. back on me. Right. So we, you know, we talked on three way and she's like, well, she sent over, you know, we sent over. I said, well, first thing is screenshots. Underwriters not going to accept screenshots. Second thing, it's not all pages. I need all pages. Third, on the bank statement, she's got the um, account numbers blacked out. So how are we going to know that when you wire those funds that it's coming from that account? Um, right. And I just let her know it, it comes from everybody, you know, like before that point, before we're trying to figure out the money piece, then we're getting the student loan paperwork done. Yeah. I asked her to get an income based repayment plan told her on the phone specifically what to get and how the process would go, followed up with an email. And she said, uh, they said my payment was X amount of dollars and I'll get it by the 22nd. And um, when we talked on the phone, she said they gave her three different options. So right there, I knew that they gave her the wrong options because when it comes to IBR, there's not three different options. This is what your payment is going to be. Right. So I, she asked, when can I get my pre-approval letter now that we have the amount? I said, well, listen, I want to make sure you have the correct information. We did a three-way call down the road because the paper hadn't come. Boom. The person didn't give them an IBR. They didn't notate what the payment was. And the payment ended up being $100 more than what she told me, which changed what she would be pre-approved for. If I had went ahead and went off what she told me and they went under contract, she doesn't have any room to do anything. Correct. So then she falls out of contract, depending on where we're at in the process, she could lose her earnest money. And I don't like that. Some people say that they don't, you know, of course, you probably heard it. Oh, my other lender doesn't do that. That's why you come back to me to fix some of their messes. Right. <laughs> so it's, you know, uh, we do a lot. We juggle a lot. You know, it's not just me, the processor, the underwriter. It's us, our assistants, if we have one, set up, underwriter, appraiser, uh, closer, funder. And you have to make sure all of those people are doing their job. And sometimes you have to reach out to them and say, hey, what's going on? I did that yesterday. And most importantly, I think with all that being said, so many different people um, touch this transaction. And yes, you are correct. You have to make sure they're doing their job. However, you also have to make sure that those people are human <laughs> and those people have lives too. Those people make mistakes also. And I think a lot of times that is what's overlooked. Like these people, just like you said, you don't want the stress on you when you are, you know, um, with your family, the same for the same applies to those people. And, you know, when we have, <clears throat> I had a, a file with the appraiser, his computer went out and he couldn't do it. And we waited weeks and weeks and weeks. And, you know, the client started, you know, pressuring me about it. And it's like, it, then somebody's mama died. A, a appraiser had already went and inspect the property. She didn't get the report because her mama died. I mean, at the end of the day, these are people and we have to realize the world does not revolve around us and we have to offer grace when grace is needed. There, there are slackers, don't get me wrong, and they have to be micromanaged or reminded or whatever, but people have lives. And I think that um, oftentimes we forget that because we want what we want so much. <laughs> and um, that is what's at the forefront of our minds. But you know, we have to, you know, realize that this is not machines. These are not machines doing these things. These are people and give them the grace that they deserve. 
Yeah, like uh, we had one where the appraiser ended up going to New York and we needed to reinspect. The appraiser ended up going to New York uh, because for a funeral. So when it was time for the reinspect, she wouldn't be back. It was probably like a Monday and we were closing on Monday. So we reached out, tried to see if someone else could um, do the reinspection and no one could get to it faster than her. Um, so the agent, uh, listing agent reached out to the um, appraiser and she said, well, I can have it in Monday morning, right? Of course, I'm leaving out the fussing, the, oh, well, this and this, this can't somebody right. do it. All of that, the appraiser comes back, oh, Tuesday isn't convenient for my client. So what's the fussing about? Like, it's not that we weren't going to get to it. You know, appraisers are swamped. So she's the fastest person to get to it. And, and now your client isn't, is not convenient for your client. Not convenient for the client to close on the Tuesday. I had gave them the suggestion to let the seller go to the attorney's office and sign his documents on Monday. Mm -hmm. And then the buyer just signs and they received the wire. But to them, the agent never conveyed that to her client. So he didn't do it which would have been easy to do. Yeah. Um, maybe because she'd never done it before. So it's so much, and you're right, people are human. You know, people, human. I, I definitely understand the importance of the transaction and the monopoly effect that it has if one doesn't close. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a delay. A slight delay. You know, I've been where, you know, like that situation, I've been where they've gone to the branch manager. Can we get this done? And she's like, HUD has not responded to the issue that we have. We can't push HUD. Like, right. this is the law. This, this is, is not yeah. me. Yeah, this is not us. This isn't a manager. You can go to the owner. HUD, right. I'm talking about in D.C., we had to wait for them to give us an answer. And mm -hmm. we have been trying. Actually, the crazy part was the buyer's agent used to work for HUD, and she reached out to one of her old supervisors, and the supervisor couldn't get an answer. Right. So we waited and waited. And, like, I think that <laughs> it, it's an emotional process, but sometimes the stuff that makes it worse is unnecessary you know it's, yeah. it's 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 unnecessary and to be able to manage people's expectations and it has to start on all parties right mm -hmm. and it depends on the level of your experience and your realtor partner's experience mm -hmm. um so i always tell people and i used not do it zelma i eat the frog right i read a book called eat the frog Mm -hmm. I do all the hard stuff in the morning, making those calls that I don't want to make because um, I used to let it linger. And then they would be like, well, when would you know? And you should have told us earlier. So then when I do it in the morning, well, we got the rest of the day. <laughs> like it's, you know, but I, to me, I feel better letting them know, hey, this is right. the scenario. We may not close on time. I'm telling you now. That way it's out of the way. So we know, and it makes it easier. Um, so let me I, ask you this. I understand the importance to the buyer of closing on time because, you know, they may have ordered a moving truck. They may have their lease may be ending, whatever it may be. But why do realtors get their pennies in such a bunch about closing a day or two late? Can you explain that to me? I don't get it. My assumption is that the money that they have is spent. Because mm. <laughs> I'm like, what's the big deal? For me, a day or two 
you know, the only way it matters to me really is if it's the end of the month. Right. And it has to roll over. Right. That's probably my only like really care. I don't really care that much. So, okay. I guess that makes sense. Maybe they're just really hard up for their money. Yeah. And then, of course, everybody (laughs) in their So for them, if it's that scenario, then maybe the money is spent and they need to have it for whatever. Right. But it could be the domino effect where if this doesn't close on the 29th, the seller can't close on their house on the 30th. The seller of that house can't close on the 31st. You see what I'm saying? Like they can't close. So our transaction could stop endless transactions. From gotcha. Asking, you okay. know what I mean? Um, so they don't want those calls. I guess I could see that. Yeah. But you know, you got brand new buyers. And, you know, it's just like, okay, a day is not going to kill you, you know. But the, but the, Sometimes, a lot of times, the realtors will make such a big stink over the client. Because I'll tell my clients at the very beginning, like, this is kind of all estimations. But remember, so many things have to happen. So be flexible, be whatever. Like, I'm going to try to make it easiest for you as possible. But again, it's so many different factors and things that are out of my hands, things are out of your hands. So when I tell the client, hey, this happened. You know, we still haven't gotten a report. Unfortunately, sometimes the appraisers don't get it in on the 20th when they say they might get it in on the 21st or they might get it in on the 20th at 9 p.m. Everybody's sleeping, (laughs) you know, so (laughs) the clients aren't as, you know, upset or stressed out. But it seems like the realtors sometimes or some realtors are just like, you know, real agitated about it and i just don't ever understand (laughs) we're only as good as our last transaction to them like we could do 10 transactions with someone depending on their loyalty and your relationship right Mm -hmm. and on that 11th transaction it could close a day or two later and then they just had a transaction with you and it went smoothly, and mine closed a day later. Now, all of a sudden, the leads are going to Zelma because she closed on time. Even though it's your first transaction with you, right? You closed on time. I did 10 that closed on time, and now the 11th was late. Some people say, oh, I can't have that. I'm going to Zelma. She closed the stuff on time. So you're not allowed. So coming from the teacher world, I think that for me, um, I can relate to a lot of that because it's unrealistic. It's like, you know, a teacher doing a perfect job and then the student failing a test. You know, some will argue the teacher didn't do a perfect job because the student still failed the test. Some will argue she did a perfect job. The student wasn't listening or the student wasn't on grade level or this or that. So when somebody says, okay, you could do 10 transactions correctly, and then you do one transaction incorrectly, and now I'm taking all my leads from you. It's kind of like, well, I'm not perfect. So I I, I feel like, is that a person you want to work with? Not really. Like if I can't do anything wrong, (laughs) like, I don't think that's a person that you want to build a business relationship with anyway, because things happen. And then guess what? The delay of the closing may not even have been your fault. Right. Yeah. So. But it does. It it all kind of goes back. um, It goes back to us in a sense. Right. Um, I feel like you're right, but you don't know. You, know, right. you don't really know until your back's against the wall and their back's against the wall mm. how the relationship goes. You know, it's tested. Yeah. The yeah. relationship's tested. Um, and you you have to make sure that we just communicate with them as much as possible. Um, problem is, there's a chain of command on our side. Right. 
if I need to find out an answer, I need to go to the underwriter to get the answer or through my, depending on how your company structure, through the processor to get the answer from the underwriter. And then right. the underwriter may not know. So they have to go to the underwriting manager. Right. Right. We have, to, they're not waiting for our client or me to have a question. They're working on hundreds of other potential files and clients from hundreds of thousands of loan officers. Right. So I have to wait to get an answer back. Where on the realtor side, you're asking your broker. And they can give you their experience or this is what you do if they have a situation. Right. So that level of getting an answer doesn't work. And we don't know everything. Like we as loan officers, I try to. I've I've never had two of the same files. Even so, even with the same person, I've never right. had the file go the same <laughs> way. Like I've got the first a time you deal with them, they didn't have a house. This <laughs> time they have a house. <laughs> yep. So the file goes different. Yeah, it, so, it like, is. It's crazy. So I always say with um with realtors, they kind of just have to be charming and they're kind of like the Vanna Whites. Like, you know, I mean, I know they do a lot of work, but we kind of have to have a strategic mind on top of all of that. You know, you have to have that sales aspect, but then you also have to have the strategic mind because you have to know how to work it to actually get it to the close table. I mean, anybody can find a house they like, I think, <laughs> in this market, maybe not. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and then like, so when you tell a realtor, Oh, that client's DTI. Oh, well, can you you approve them for two hundred? Well, can they go to two hundred and fifty? Their DTI doesn't allow them. Well, uh, well, what can we do? Like, they need to make more money. I don't know <laughs> what what can we do. We can't do anything. I so when you get realtors like that, you don't even understand DTI. It's hard to work with them because. They don't understand. So I think you're like the perfect mix because you've been on both sides of the spectrum. So maybe you can understand and you can explain it better. But no. <laughs> no, I, I, and I say, it, I, I mean, I don't understand. Um, I do. I, I understand them not knowing because everybody doesn't want to know their business the way okay 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 you know saying? like the way you look at being a loan officer could be totally different in the way i look at it mm. so you may say 680 conventional got your own money that's all i'm doing me if they if i can make it work i don't care if it's fha conventional va usda bank statements right if this person want to buy a house i'm gonna make it work and both neither one are incorrect because it's your business right, right. and it's what zelma wants to do and what type of clients she has and it's what kevin wants to do and what type what type of clients i want to have i've saved deals that to me I didn't do nothing special right I just knew the guidelines mm -hmm. because I deal with all kinds of buyers let's be honest my buyers typically have if closing cost is $11,250 they got $11,250 and one cent <laughs> like anything over, yeah. like my, my, I don't have buyers that have a ton of money and we get creative. We save money. Matter of fact, I got a client now. She was worried about coming up with her closing costs. Her and I was on the phone troubleshooting, went back to her former employer and forgot she had a 401k sitting there. And she's been gone for three years. And now she has the money that she needs to close. So like it just so I said all that to say. 
it's more than just showing a house. Right now, you can come out of real estate school with no knowledge of real estate because you just learn on the loan officer side too. We just learn how to pass the test, and you can get. And the test is more about laws that everybody else take care of. A lot of stuff that was on the test, the attorney takes care of. Yeah, the attorneys, the disclosure department, the closing departments. Like you don't start the, you know, you're not on the transaction from beginning to end. Yeah, so. But some of those things, you know, they pop up every once in a while. But yeah, most of the stuff is more so law stuff. But you don't really get into that as a loan officer. No, nah, we don't. We don't. Yeah. Um, so with that, has there been a point with all that we go through, right, in the real estate transaction, all of us? Listen, I talk to attorneys and they people think of attorneys real estate attorneys nine to five when the last closing's done they go home i talk to attorneys who don't get out of their office until seven eight o'clock at night they go home they eat and then they go back to work and they get up early so right now in this market because it's so busy we're all in this together yeah um with that being said have you ever come across a situation where you're like, I'm going back into the school system? No. No? Neither. I think that <clears throat> what the school system did for me was teachers are stressed. Like, we teachers work like attorneys and get paid like a sanitation worker. <laughs> so I think that it literally prepared me for this type of stress level. So it, I, it's never been a situation where I think to myself, um, I want to go back into the classroom. Um, the security of a salary is appealing. <laughs> However, the freedom and the flexibility that I have and the things that I'm learning or so much, um, I enjoy it a lot more. So I'm just like a person that likes to learn. So when I taught math for so long, then I moved to social studies because I wanted to learn that. So now I'm learning something new. So right now I'm totally fine with where I am because I'm constantly learning new things with different files every single time. Um, I'm able to pick my daughter up from school, drop her off in the mornings. So the, all of those things that I could not do as a teacher, I'm doing now and I'm loving it. So once I get bored, then maybe I might want to go back to the classroom. I do miss my relationships with students, um, you know, because I really liked, I like children. So I miss that. But otherwise, no, not trying to go back to the classroom. Gotcha. At all. At all. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Teachers and police officers for what they do, <coughs> severely underpaid. Severely underpaid. Yeah, severely underpaid. No. Um, that's why you saw a mass exodus of teachers, you know, when COVID hit. They, you guys were already stressed, you know, buying supplies out of your pocket for the classroom when you don't make a lot. You know what I mean? And then to mm -hmm. add COVID on top of it and they want you to do something different, I probably would quit too. And um, constantly not feeling good enough. And that's the thing um, with this job, because with teachers, you're constantly being analyzed all the time. So like when we have a delay in a in a realtor is upset, like that's really like nothing to me. Like you'll be all right. Because at the end of the day, when we get to the close table, everybody's going to forget about that. And they're happy. Everybody always remembers um, the good things once they've, you know, passed. Unless it's just an absolute nightmare, but it's never, I've never had a situation where it's an absolute nightmare where they wouldn't be, you know, happy at the end. Right. So. What, um, skill sets that you developed as a teacher you think have helped you the most uh, as a loan officer time management 
um, I don't know what to call it, but like task completion. And so as a teacher, you could work 24 hours a day if you want to. My first year teaching, I would plan lessons till nine o'clock at night. I literally would just have one day off because on Sundays I would be planning for Monday. It was just a level of anxiety that was always at 100 all the time. So I think learning to manage my time, learning to manage my anxiety, learning to create boundaries on when I'm not going to work, I'm just not going to work. Like, and I have to be able to um, have that work-life balance that I need because I can't work like that anymore. When I started, when I first started as a teacher, I was not a mother and all I did was work. So that was like my life and it was okay at that point in time. But once I had a family, I had to be able to learn to create those boundaries, do things for me, do things for my family, and not have to worry about what's happening um, at work on Monday or, you know, the next day. Right. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I, you're probably no, not probably you're the third teacher that I've interviewed. Um, that got into real estate. The other two were actually kindergarten teachers who ended up becoming realtors. Um, mm-hmm. So that prepped them for similar things. The task oriented on their end, the education piece to the buyers. You know what I mean? Like the the one realtor that I'm thinking of, uh, she actually did a class for some of the realtors that I had relation. And you could tell she was a teacher, excellent instructor. Yeah. You know, broke it down to where I was in the back taking notes. I was like, <laughs> but like yeah. just just educating buyers. And you know, like I know some teachers who were doing it part-time, um, besides those two, and then they kind of just transitioned to it full time after they retired. Um, so I mean, I think. I think people don't understand how hard you work in real estate. It looked great, um, but you work hard. Like realtors are working they behinds off. Like yeah. for us, we're working hard, but we're stationary, right? You're in a big city. I'm in a, a large area. And the houses that the buyers are seeing might be 20 minutes apart with no traffic. You add traffic, yeah. You add accidents, yeah. Waiting in line to get into a house, mm-hmm. get in, and you got to be across town in ten minutes. Where there's another line, um, it's just it's hectic. So right, they spend a lot of time in their cars and showing, and they, I mean, they spend a lot of time, you know, looking for stuff because it's a lack of um inventory right yeah it's and that's yeah that's the biggest thing um lack of inventory builders can't build fast enough um we i was telling so so people keep asking about the market crashing not an economist i just know what i remember from the great recession right Mm -hmm. two different markets in that great recession it was a ton of inventory a ton of new construction inventory and then the foreclosure wave allowed for it to be more inventory i'm thinking if half the people who are pre-qualified now something happened and they could no longer buy we still don't have enough inventory for the other half that's left we don't. Like we're five million homes short. So I know everyone always says that it's interest rates that has caused this, like interest rates being so low. But how is that possible? Do you really believe that interest rates are so low and that's why everybody's buying up the houses? I don't think so. Like, it helps. Right. So it helps 
for the person that purchased the home and their interest rate was 5%, 6%, because there's still some people out there who have those high rates. So that could attest for the refinancing, right? Mm-hmm. But those people aren't buying new houses, yeah. Right. But some of those people that are refinancing are buying investment properties. Now, that's true. Right. Then you have the investors. There's more options to buy investment properties. So then investors are buying properties. What happened in 2008 affected home pricing, but rental pricing never went down. So now people are looking at rentals for $1,500, $1,600, $1,700 a month, and they're getting educated and like, I might as well buy a house if I'm going to pay $1,700 a month in rent. I might as well see if I can purchase. Then there's more of us, realtors, loan officers, people, investors looking to educate people. The economy is doing well, and it's just a great ball of wax of where people are getting more educated, there's more entrepreneurs making more money. There's more incentives. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, the thing of it is, um, is they're doing it right. Meaning, yes, I'm sure at some point somewhere, I think I read recently that there's still some mortgage fraud and you're going to have that in anything. Right. But the bad loans and doing things wrong, like I've never been at a company so as a loan officer, they don't play any gray areas. And that's great. Mm-hmm. So they stay above board, right? So everybody's wanting to be a homeowner. Home. Think about it. For me, as a kid, all I've ever heard was home ownership, home ownership, home ownership, buying a home, go to college, graduate, get a good job, buy a home. Right. So now everybody is looking to buy a home along with it's hard to find rentals rental income is the, i mean rental uh, properties cost just as much to rent as it is to buy in some cases uh, sometimes people save money um interest rates being low helps and just think about real estate is what looks sexy to everybody yeah ball player rapper <laughs> entrepreneur real estate Those are things that people want to be in, right? So I think it's just a combination of everything. So then you see real estate going, which brings an influx of people who want to get into real estate as realtors, right? Loan officers, because opportunity to make some good money. Um, Attorneys firms who kind of got out of it when the market tanked, and now it's a need because it's more deals. So, you know, it's kind of like going to all of the, um, you know, everybody's getting into it for some reason, Um, which goes to the next thing that I was going to mention is the one thing people aren't flocking to because it's a hard barrier of entry is appraisers. Right. And we need appraisers. We need appraisers. We, we, we desperately nationwide, we need appraisers. We need appraisers, but they put when they corrected things, they put a stupid stipulation on it. You got to have a college degree. Yeah. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yep. I knew you have to have like a whole bunch of hours. A thousand uh, hours as an apprentice. Yeah. But I didn't know about the college degree. Got to have a college degree. Um, I believe they said they were working on lifting that. Um hmm. So right now, like appraisers are overworked too. Just think about it. In a year, let's say in Houston, you guys bring on 250 new realtors. Half of those realtors do one additional deal a month. So that's 125 extra deals. Okay. Let's say five loan officers come into the business so they can take some of that weight off of the other loan officers. There might be one new appraiser that comes in, but that's still an extra 125 deals a month. Right. So they're overworked. <laughs> so they can't get it in on time. Yeah. Um, they can't. I mean, granted, they've come up with 
appraisal waivers on some stuff, <laughs> but I've never been able to get one. I've gotten one on a refinance. Yeah, I've never been able to get an appraisal mm -hmm. appraisal waiver. Um, but like it's you know, and then the other part is most appraisers that I know are older. Like I don't know any younger. Right. Appraisers, right. I don't know what's gonna happen when yeah. It, there's just not enough of them. Yep, yeah, it's not enough. It's not enough appraisers. Um, I, I mean, so when I say them appraisers are older, older. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they are. So then they don't get around like they used to either. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I, you know how you solve that problem? <laughs> you know, you just got to market figure out how to get more appraisers. Yeah. Um, I've talked to maybe shoot four or five people that I can remember in the 17 years I've been around that even talked about being an appraiser. I but, actually um, have a friend that I actually closed her loan and when her appraisal was late and I explained to her why and how it was, um, like right when we were about to close, she was like, oh, I enrolled into the um, to the appraisal class. I was like, what? So she's actually interested in doing it. And I was telling her, you know, because she saw how much she paid for it. And I was telling her how, you know, it's in such demand right now. So she's actually, so that's like the only person I know that actually has took action. But I tell everyone that appraisers are, um, <clears throat> that appraisers are, um, you know, in high demand right now. So if you're looking for something to get into, maybe they would like get into the high schools now and start, you know, how they used to do when you were like a senior in high school and they would start talking about, it. I remember when I was in high school, nurses was really big, like nurse shortage, like job security and this is this and that. So maybe they'll start doing appraisers, appraisers like that. I mean, when you think about it, all trades, plumbing, HVAC, electrical work, yes. I don't see any new. When know. before that was like really popular. Remember, they used to be in trade schools. Um, it was just like, I know when my sisters, my I was telling you earlier, my sisters are a lot older than I am. They actually came out of high school with trades until yeah. this day. Um, they've all made careers out of it, you know. So I guess those days are gone. They used to have welding in school, they used to have all those trades, and now so I guess it's kind of like fashion, like things go out of style and then they come back around. So that's kind of where we are now with the whole trade. Like we need people to do those things. As a landlord, when I'm looking for people to do stuff, fix stuff, it's hard to find people. And when I do, they're older, older, and, um, you know, they know their stuff, but like my AC guy, he can't go into the attics anymore because he's so old. So he gets like, you know, he has to find a little young person to come with him and you know, where he could tell him what to do and what to look for. But imagine if he doesn't have any sons, this guy, I know him, uh, he doesn't have any sons. So imagine if he did have a son or just someone that he could latch on to, that he could teach them how to, you know, take on this trade and manage a business. Right. I'm laughing because my father-in-law is <laughs> in construction. He's a... Uh... I mean, now he still builds some for people like he helps people mm -hmm. uh, but he's 70 and I asked him uh, about <laughs> work he does and he's like I'm getting old I'm old he said anything mm -hmm. that required me to go under a house or get on my knees I'm not doing right he's like if I, I'm not painting no more <laughs> I might paint a room he say he'll tinker tinker on some stuff, but he said all that extra, he's not. And you know, you know, like we're 
you know, you and I are probably blessed because where we're at, like you're in Houston and I'm in mm-hmm. Metro Atlanta. But when I go to different places, like smaller towns looking for stuff, it's hard to find repair people. And if you can find them, they're busy because it's not many of them. And then it's not many good ones. Um, So then you have a lot of people that, you know, scam artists and they're not doing it and you can't trust them. It's it's hard. We need those type of people to. um, I've been looking for a property manager forever. And, you know, to say that the business is booming. It's hard to find people that are. It's so many different roles in real estate. You make you can make good money managing properties. I can't find property managers. I can't find the people to do the things that, you know, collect rent, maintain properties and do all that. And then, you know, when you do find someone, I think that people do, uh, they don't, I don't know, you know, it's just like any other business. You have to find the, the right team that works for you. Right. I mean, maybe that's an opportunity for, I mean, the both of us, meaning um, a real estate career night, how you can get into real estate as a realtor, yeah. how you can become an appraiser, loan officer, um, maybe the local pipe fitters or whatever, just have somebody come out, and, you know, insurance agents, just how you can get into real estate, the different facets, the property right. management piece. And then just have, you know, just educate people on it. Um, Because you can make you can make good money, you know, in those um, in those fields. But people just don't know how to get in. Everybody thinks only way they could get into real estate is to be a realtor and a loan officer. (laughs) We have enough of those. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And we need some of the other people to help support us. Yes. Even processors, like I didn't even know about being a processor because honestly, I probably would have maybe if I would have known started there and then kind of moved up to being an LO just to understand better and kind of train more. Uh, But I didn't even know nothing about that. And a lot of times they want you to have experience in every single thing. Like what? So let's talk about that. What's up with that? Nobody wants to train anybody no more. Like (laughs) how will we get new people if nobody ever wants to train? That's the thing. You have so many. So I got a client. I got a text message on the 7th of September. Mm-hmm. I did it. I passed. Show me a picture of her passing MLO uh, course. Mm-hmm. Yes. I said, that's a great job client of mine. So then she texted me yesterday. Is your company hiring for new LOs? And I knew she was going to ask. So I asked in advance and we're not. Because our branch is just going up, getting up. So we're looking for support staff. And then right. maybe after that, we'll bring in new LOs. I told her, and I always tell new loan officers, if I had to do all over again, I would come in as a loan officer assistant. Mm-hmm. You get paid a salary, and then you probably get bonus depending on where you're at. Even though you're licensed, you can see more files faster than you can by yourself. Right. So if you're working with a team and they've got three LOs and you're pulling credit for them and pre-approving people, the, you might see 30 files in a month between the three. But if you're on your own, you might see five. So you're going to get it faster. The success that I had started once I started seeing more files So the quickest way to do it is a loan officer assistant and you're pretty much getting paid to learn. Some companies will allow you to be a loan licensed loan officer assistant, get paid, get bonus. And then you might be able to do one or two deals a month on your own. That's probably all you're going to be doing in the beginning uh, until you get a grasp of what you're doing because you don't know the information. Right. Um, So I tell people, listen, fail fast. Yep. Yep. Fail fast and you can do it. 
Um, but they don't want to train because we are already at capacity. It's hard to find processors, underwriters. All the good processors are pretty much taken. Somebody. So somebody's going to have to train new people. That's my whole thing. Like it, like it has to come a point where we, someone is ha- is going to have to like just take a moment and say, look. We need to train about 10 new processors. Just take the time and train 10 new people or something, Um, you know, train LOAs is it's becoming this is part of the reason why we're so stressed out, though, because we just don't have enough support staff. Even for me, uh, that's how we connected. I was looking for, you know, someone to to train or new places and new opportunities. Cause when I started out, I was actually working for a broker. The broker was a part, a teacher as well, full-time and was a part-time loan officer. Oh. The loan officer. Um, so when I would get deals, cause of course I started, you know, marketing myself as a mortgage loan officer. When I started to get deals, I really had no support there to train me or, whatever. So, you know, a few times we would go and we would go meet at Whole Foods and just kind of work there, but it wasn't working for me. It it wasn't um, effective. I wasn't learning anything. I was a loan officer for an entire year and hadn't closed one deal and I had leads. So um, it needs to be some kind of, you know how they have the the school to pass the test they need a training school too because <laughs> there's no one that's willing to take the time and just actually do it and then you think like like branch managers like you know in your position it would be nice if like you well you know as a learning loan officer it would be nice if my branch manager didn't do his own loans and he could just answer questions all day like he do two three loans a month maybe that would be nice so you could actually have time to train me and nurture me like I need to be trained and nurtured which would make sense because you're making money off of my loans anyway so my thing is why are you still the top loan officer and you own the branch too shouldn't you be taking a step back and training more or something? I don't know. Is that making sense or am I in la la? No, it makes sense. So when I when I came here, uh, how I got in, uh, we, we were moving from Delaware to Georgia. I reached out to some realtors from online. They couldn't, one answer connected me with, she gave me the number three loan officers, one answer. When we came down to Georgia, uh, we met with him. He asked me, had I ever considered uh, being a loan officer? And I had at the time, but I lived in a small area in Delaware, was known for being a realtor. And the realtors knew me as a realtor. So that transition would probably affect my living. Right. So when I came down here, nobody knew me. So I had to reinvent myself either way I went. Um, so I knew I could get there. Right. The offer was there. I was good. So I just wanted to test the waters. I couldn't get anybody to take me on to train me. But at the same time, I didn't know as many companies were mortgage companies as there were. I tried a few, but of course I didn't want to wait too long. So I, it came down to uh, Wells, PNC. I lost you there. Yeah, I don't know. It came okay. down to Wells Fargo. PNC and um, the company I was at, Homestar. So it was between those three companies, and I went with uh, Homestar, and I didn't. They didn't have a training program set up. So my branch manager, he was still producing, um, and he did his best. You know what I mean? Like he did some training. Um, but he was busy and Mm -hmm. I reached out to other LOs in the company and we kind of worked together. Right. But it didn't, it was, I didn't have any training. 
So I got kicked and I tell I got kicked in the mouth a lot because I would mess up stuff. I didn't mm-hmm. know what I was doing. Um, and you get one shot. I'm the new guy. You get one shot. You mess it up. They don't use you again. So then I'm going to an office with a bunch of realtors and they see me. They'll talk, but they're not sending me anything. Um, so I just started messing around with files and learning from the mistake that I made mm-hmm. on other ones. Um, so I decided I left. I went to another company and um, they had great system in place, but I was apprehensive, right? Because I had messed up and I didn't want to make those mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go in for the support that they could have gave me. Um, I was still able to get some business. Just it started coming in or my marketing efforts and things that I did but I didn't want too much because I still didn't know what I was doing. Right. So finally felt like I hit my groove. Too much. And, scary sometimes. Huh? Too much gets scary. Like, yeah. So I finally hit my groove <clears throat> and then the company I was with was garbage processing corporate and locally just weren't good. So, uh, now that I'm in my groove and I feel like I know a lot more, but I'm in the wrong system. So then I, I'm spending time looking and then I found a match. And I found someone who helped me see things a little differently, spent more, a little bit more time. And she didn't benefit from it in terms of financially. She mm-hmm. spent a little bit more time showing me certain things to do. No, do this this way. Go find out that like she trained me. And that's when my business started to go, because just some of the little things that she taught me got me over some hurdles that I could figure the rest out. Um, right. But I don't have any. I mean, I start doing better after I start seeing more files, which leads to what I said earlier. You got to fail fast. Um looking at credit, knowing when to just let them go. Uh, Your loan officer is not a credit repair person. Um, Yes, we uh, we look at surface level things to see if we can help and get the score up. I used to do a a comprehensive game plan, and then they would call back and ask a bunch of questions that would take time, uh, or you would reach out to them in your follow-up and they haven't started and then you follow up and they haven't started and then the follow-ups become further and further apart and then they call you back in six months and say hey i'm ready did you do anything that i told you no can you print it out for me again so like you know those things and you have to learn to go like as i progressed as a loan officer um i i learned that I didn't want to do that because it took more time. It took more, it takes a lot of time to sit there and figure out what to do with your credit. So I refer them to a credit repair specialist. If they don't want to invest that time into them and I can't find anything surface level, then you don't want the investment because the problem is, um, is I was doing it and then they would go to another loan officer or yeah. a new construction site. Yeah. And they, I did all the and work. And they go in with the builder's lender. Yep, builder's lender. I enjoy the, I enjoy the whole handing. I guess this is the teacher in me. I enjoy that, but I don't have the time for that. And I literally told someone yesterday that I wish I could afford to hire someone specifically for that. Because that would double my production for one, because there's a lot of people I have to turn away. So if I could hire somebody just to hold that, you know, work with the people on the credit piece, but also holding them accountable. You know, I have people come to me with twenty dollars in their bank account. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, I wish there was I could hire someone. Their credit is OK. Their credit is decent. But just, you know, making sure that they 
keep their credit on track. And then also, okay, where are you now? How much do you have saved now? Somebody that's just going to constantly hold their hand. And then when they're ready, okay, Zoma, that person is ready, but like on my team. So that would help a whole bunch because you could get people clothes, you know, because a lot of people want to buy houses. They just can't because they think it's easy, like buying a car or something like that, or no money down. You know, you hear all these things in this myth and it's just like, you know, that's not really possible. Yep. They bring it and you go back, they bring you get the bank statement and $20. Mm-hmm. And then you look back at the applications, like in the $400,000 house, <laughs> like it just, yeah, it just, it, it's uh, just like, why do you even think that you could do it? But some people also just want you to tell them what to do. So that's where a hand holding person would be, you know, useful too. Cause they, they know they're not ready. You know, they'll send you a message like, I just want to know what I need to do. And somebody told me um, that I could, you know, buy a house with no money down or with, you know, $20. <laughs> so, I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> nah, they lied. Nah, they lied. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what do you think... Um, so you're what, two years in? Mm-hmm. Really one full, full. complete year. Because the first year, I didn't really close anything. Um, and then, so what, June made one complete year as a full-time loan officer. But yeah, two years in. So as a full-time loan officer who's completed one full year, what would you? what advice would you give to someone looking to get into the business um, with no experience, of course, like, I mean, you came in, we all come in with no experience, right? There would be a couple of things that you would have them do that you see now that you never knew that you should have done in advance. I mean, so first of all, what I propose is that we, in our industry, we create like a, you know how they have barber schools and cosmetology schools where you could go get a haircut but you just get like a little discounted rate (laughs) and you get your hair done and you know you get the discounted rate we need something like that in real estate so that's the first thing and I wish they existed (laughs) because it's necessary um so yeah, if you ever know somebody that's looking for a new investment, maybe that would be a good idea. Yeah, so there, somewhat, we have that somewhat with um, we do call centers. Call centers. There's call oh, yeah, centers. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like like and stuff yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, it was new. It was a mortgage company and I even tried to apply for the call center and I didn't even get a call back from them. <laughs> um, but it needs to be all that, like the appraisers, the LOAs, the processors, you know, to give you a full run. But, you know, to answer your question, what I would say is work on your self-management. Even though this career does not require a college degree, college is what helped me self-manage. And I think in this profession, it requires a lot of self-managing, meaning um, my boss is busy. But guess what? I go drive and I go get in his face because I need an answer because at the end of the day, I have to feed my family. So, you know, it requires self-management, it requires grit. So make sure your game is up on that because people are going to ignore you all day long via text message, (laughs) via email, via whatever. So you have to be able to uh, be consistent, be persistent, and get the answers you need. Rather it be from your, your, your trainer, your clients, your realtors. Um, so that's what I would really say. I don't necessarily think that you need like a whole bunch of knowledge or anything. To me, that's what 
what prepared me is like, I'm going to get my answer. I don't care if I got to Google it. I'm going to find my answer. So. Hmm. So. In terms of your 2020, you don't have to give me specific numbers. Mm -hmm. From 2020 to now, um, have you seen a change in business because now you have more deals under your belt? Oh, yeah. I don't think it's just necessarily, though, the deals. It's me actually giving it 100%, meaning... Uh, marketing myself, making relationships, building relationships, you know, reaching out to people, nurturing just my career as a mortgage loan officer. Before, you know, it was passive. So it's passive, you know, that was on the back burner. Um, teaching was my priority. And I will work on loans when I got off of work. But now all I have to do is work on loans. So I, if I don't have a loan to work on, I'm finding a way to get a loan to work on. Whereas uh, before, if I didn't get a loan, it didn't bother me because I, you know, was that wasn't my priority. So I think the increase in business is not because I've seen more files; is because I'm actually working as a loan officer in nurturing. And so that was kind of one of the things once I came on with the team I'm on now, he said, this is not really a job you could do part time. You know, you, you know, you get calls, they want their calls answered. You know, they can't wait till after five o'clock when you could call them back. Um, so you get emails, you have to answer it, you know, things like that. So it wasn't really a job that I could do um, passively, which obviously I noticed because I had been doing it a year and hadn't gotten any closes. So I just had to, you know, make a commitment to it and get it done. So I think that is ultimately what contributes to my uh, growth is just my dedication and my commitment to it. That's just like anything, you know, they always say water the grass, the grass is not green on the other side. You just need to water your own grass. So I'm watering my grass here instead of, you know, looking at something else. Gotcha. Cool. Zelma, this has been a great uh, conversation. Good interview. Just kind of see the, the, the viewpoint of a loan officer a um, little bit who's been in it a little less than me. Like I've been in it five years, but that's still not long. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I can still see a lot of things from a newbie because really they said after your third year is really when you should be hitting your stride third or fourth year. Because mm -hmm. um, you don't, it's, it's, it's so much to learn. Every day is changing. You and I could go to sleep Sunday night and Monday morning, they've put in a new guideline. And then it could affect deals that we have under contract um, or, or it could help us with deals that we have um, turned away, it could affect them either way, negative mm -hmm. or positively. Right? right. So those are things we have to know. Um, but I'm looking forward to to watching you grow. Uh, I just want to say thank you for your time. And I'm here. You know, anytime you hit me up and you got a question. I'm here to answer it. And actually, since our conversation, I got some ideas for you that we'll talk about um, okay. that I think could work for you as well. Um, but thank you. Uh, definitely look forward to watching your growth and I want you to enjoy your day. All righty. Thank All right. you. This has been the Real Estate Priorities Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Jefferson. Have a great day. Thank you for watching the Real Estate Proverbs podcast with Kevin Jefferson. Make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel so you can be notified when the latest video drops.